Hey everybody, welcome back to the Chasing Frets podcast. My name is Jason Shadrick with Premier Guitar, and I'm joined once again by my co-host Joe Gore. How you doing, Joe? Doing great, Jason, and um, really especially stoked about today's interview. We're talking to Gretchen Men, who is a fascinating player with an interesting background and some very unique techniques. Yeah, I uh, first became aware of her through, and we talk about this in, in a later episode this week of her work in Zepparella, this really excellent um, all-female Led Zeppelin tribute band. Um, but that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of uh, a bunch of different records of hers, and it really kind of struck me as how how the the vast kind of scope of her work, especially her her most her latest record, Abandon All Hope, um, which we talk about in depth this week, and that was the one that kind of caught your ear too, wasn't it, Joe? Yeah, well, it's you know I feel an affinity with Gretchen because like her, I'm a renegade classical musician. I started out on classical and then switched to you know pop and rock music only later, and that's her story too. She was a very very serious um, classical guitar student and focused on that in college, and uh, then when she finished her education, she wanted to focus more on electric guitar, more on performing, but she brought a lot of the classical training with her. And uh, even when she's not specifically playing classical, a lot of classical sensibilities still filter through in the music, Uh, both Mm -hmm. her technique for playing and her concept of, uh, you know, composition and structure. It's a really interesting hybrid. Yeah. And it was really interesting. You'll hear today in today's episode, her whole approach about uh, her finger style tone and, and what kind of developments and, and concepts she kind of tackled in college to help kind of refine her, her approach to that, which I thought was really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, one thing you hear when you listen to her playing is that she has a, um, her tone production is, is just gorgeous and she gets a uh, very, very warm sounds when she's playing on classical. She just gets a, you know, just a perfect concert tone. And when she's playing on electric, sometimes she gets more of a Eric Johnson-y violinistic tone, but a lot of focus on the note attack and the note production and exactly what her fingers are doing and how she produces the notes. So there'll be a lot of little nuggets here that you'll be able to take out uh, in this episode. So make sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcast. If you want to reach out to me, Joe, or Andy, you can hit us up at Chasing Frets at premierguitar.com, and uh, we're going to throw it right now to our conversation with Gretchen Men. Welcome to Chasing Frets. I'm here once again with Joe Gore and our guest for this week, Gretchen Men. How are you, Gretchen? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's really, we're really stoked to uh, talk to you for a bit. We've been looking forward to this one. Very much likewise. So one topic we wanted to talk to you about was perhaps the classical guitar influence in what you do. Uh, you've released a, a new album, Abandon All Hope, and it's a big record. It's It's based on Dante's Inferno. It's an all-instrumental record, but um, with the combination of guitar trio and, and chamber orchestra, and it's a very, very composed, very organized, uh, very ambitious piece. And one thing that stands out throughout is you have such great beauty of tone, whether it's, you know, whether it's on the classical guitar or on some of the you know, slow, aching, distorted solos but um, we just wanted to talk to you about tone production. How do you get such pretty sounds, and and does some of it have to do with your uh, roots in classical study? Oh well, first, thank you. That's a very kind question. Um, I, I think I've always um, gravitated to to players whose whose tone I think is known for being great. Eric Johnson was the reason I first decided I got to pick up a guitar, and I found myself. Um, often put off by the content, uh, or I should say, I've, I've been put off from good content by bad tone to my ears. And obviously tone is so subjective. Nobody goes to an amp and says, let me dial up a really annoying tone. I mean, maybe Zappa would do that, but you know, um, but, but everybody dials up what they think sounds good or what's comfortable for them to play. Um, so 
I do think that, um, that at least tone is something that is important to me. And I think even being conscious of it is something that will probably help you head in, in a good direction. Um, having said that, I did start m- most seriously on classical guitar. And my teacher was very um, focused on tone production. Philip DeFremery was my teacher. Um, he's still a mentor. How do you spell that? Uh, D-E and then space F-R-E-M-E-R-Y. And was he in co- did you stay with him in college? Or? Yeah, yeah. He teaches classical guitar for the five colleges in the um, Western Mass. So like Amherst, Mount oh, yeah. Holyoke, UMass, Smith. Um, Which one was yours? Smith. So um, so he he taught me the the patience to sit there for fifteen minutes playing one note and and willing it to sound the way. I wanted it to sound. I think it's easy to get into the minutia of tone production, but I almost feel that the best the best advice I could give to anybody on this is don't be afraid to take the time to will the sounds you hear in your head through your fingers because sometimes it's an adjustment that is so so subtle that it would be really hard to describe from one person to another. And furthermore, all of us have different, you know, physiology, right? You know, the, the size of my fingers against the strings are going to be different from somebody who's got like really big, heavy hands, right? Um, just the shapes of our fingers, you know, people, some people have flatter calluses, some people have more crusty calluses, but you can get good tone with, whatever you have at your disposal, I think if you're committed to having that be a priority. Can you, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the willing your tone into existence process? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's an exercise in patience and discipline. And, and also I think it was very instrumental to have a teacher like Philip DeFremery sit there with me during a lesson and make me play the same note for five minutes straight and show how the tone difference could be, not just in like how close it is to the bridge or to the fretboard, but but the speed of the finger across the the strings. Oh, I should mention, I don't play with nails, which I know is very unusual. I was going to ask you when you were holding your hand up there. (laughs) Yeah, I don't have nails. Many nails, yeah. (laughs) I don't have nails. I was very relieved not to have to grow nails. Um, My teacher doesn't play with nails. Um, which I know puts us in a very tiny minority, but boy, is it nice not to have to think about that. And since so far I've been happy with the tones that I'm getting, um, I haven't felt the need to, to cultivate something that will be high maintenance. Was it something you tried while you were in college going the nail route or was it just like, it's working. I'm just going to go with it. No, I mean, it was really my first serious i i'd had an electric guitar like in high school and messed around with it but i got serious about it in college and classical lessons were the first kind of discipline lessons i had and the first time i said okay i'm actually going to start practicing as opposed to just picking up the guitar whenever i feel like it and um so i just i asked my the first day do i have to grow nails and he showed me he didn't have nails and i was like sweet did his methods emphasize rest stroke a lot, or did he tend to be more of a strictly free st- free stroke player? Both, both rest strokes were were deliberated and inputted into my scores. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was something that we we did both of a lot. And 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 how much do you ever play steel stringed instruments with your fingertips? Yes, yeah, I do actually. Um, uh, the way that I play acoustic guitar for the most part is with my fingers and more and more I'm playing electric guitar with my fingers too. Not, not exclusively. I mean, if I, if I got to a show and couldn't find my pick, I would be very distraught, but, but I'm writing a lot of things on electric guitar that, that are kind of more finger style. I'm, I'm working on an album right now that is exclusively um, guitar oriented pieces, different from, abandon all hope, but trying to keep that compositional sensibility, but seeing how much I can 
do just with my my primary instrument. It's also a little bit more practical for live playing. <laughs> and just 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 for anybody who hasn't heard the Abandon All Hope record, which you should do, um, it's not uh, it's a large format composition. It doesn't it is not guitar start to finish, and for great portions of the album, you have a a, a melodic foil in the form of your first violinist. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. two there's two very strong solo voices on this record, right? But right. that makes an interesting circle back to the Eric Johnson thing because one of the right. one of what I think of as the defining Eric Johnson properties is that kind of unconventional pick attack where it almost seems to um, well people have called it a violinistic tone. It kind mm-hmm. of seems to suck back the um, uh, the initial transient of the note a little further back in time, and yeah. I don't know if you're emphasizing that in order to jibe with the string players on your record, but um, a lot of phrases start and it takes the listener a moment to tell whether it's an electric guitar or the violin. Well, that's, that's good. To, to me, it's good. It was my hope. What I, what I did um, with that and, and choosing the tones for that album is I had my guitar be the last thing I recorded and I decided to reamp the guitars that I was I was tracking the guitars at home through a, a rig and a tone that was what I imagine would be pretty similar to the final tone. But because, as you know, the album is so long, so composed, it, it's not something you, that I could have even imagined just going into the studio for a few days and just laying down my guitar tracks. Um, we're talking pages of score and memorization like you wouldn't believe, um, because I wrote the album away from the guitar. So I wrote the album and then I had to go back and figure out what fingerings I was going to use on the guitar and see what passages weren't going to work. And so that was such a huge undertaking that it made sense from a, just a financial perspective to do all the guitar tracking at home. But what I'm, what that enabled me to do that I'm very glad I did is I got all of my takes and then I was able to go into a proper studio and with my arsenal of amps run my direct signal through the different amps and then here, not as a guitar player, what was comfortable to be playing, but here as like a producer and as a composer, what was the tone that worked better with the other instruments? So I chose my tone very much based on how does my guitar make the violin sound? How does, you know, does my guitar allow these other instruments to be heard? So um, there was a little bit of dialing that in. It's not It isn't like you can read about that in a Rimsky orchestration book. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of orchestration when you're talking about classical instruments is something that even though you can have unconventional methods of orchestration, there are certain things that good orchestrators just know and something that I kind of tried to dive into a little bit. But blending an electric guitar with classical instruments is a more obviously modern conception and required a little bit more trial and error. So. yeah. For anyone listening who's not a classical dork, she's referring to the Rimsky-Korsakoff orchestration book, which is kind of regarded as one of the two great masterpieces on the technique of orchestration, along with Hector Samuel Berlioz's Adler. book. Oh, that oh, t- Berlioz, t- yeah. 20th century, yeah. 20, yeah historically. Exactly. And of course, there was no electric guitar back then, so you can get all sorts right. of great <laughs> advices about how to how to group yeah. the strings and play sections of the orchestra against each other, but it doesn't uh-huh. tell you like how to dial in your shred tone to match the violins. <laughs> Exactly. How not to step all over your own composition. So when when you were kind of developing your your concept of a good finger style tone, were there other guitar players you were listening to that you kind of aspired to? And when you heard them play, you're like, I, I want to sound more like other than Eric, of course. But Eric's not necessarily a finger style player. But yeah. were there other ones, other finger style players that you look towards? It was more classical guitar at the beginning, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, my teacher and. Uh, you know, Segovia, of course. Um, I actually heard a story from my teacher that I hope I won't get in trouble for saying about Segovia because it sounds very apocryphal, but, but he swears it's true. He was in a master class and somebody raised their hand and said, you know, maestro, what's the secret of your tone? And he said, Segovia, who is, I guess, kind of infamous for his temper turned like beet red because you weren't supposed to ask such pedestrian questions in a master class, right? It's like, what type of strings do you use? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, you idiot. But he turned beat red and then apparently he like pointed to the guy and was like, 
And my teacher said, for some reason, he doesn't know what possessed him because it's not like him. He got up with the guy and kind of just shadowed him. And Segovia had them look over his shoulder and he just hit like, th- like three chords. Didn't say a word, but what my teacher said he noticed is that he was using his fingertips, not his nails. And my teacher said he went home, had an identity crisis, cut off his nails and proceeded to relearn how to play the guitar, the the classical guitar. So that was enough for me to be like, okay, well, I'm going to stick with the no nail thing. It's not the coolest story though. I yeah, hope it's I think true. <laughs> I think Lawrence Juber plays with without nails too. Does he? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing that one time and or seeing him in concert and I was like, wow, he gets such a like it, you know his tone. It doesn't when I hear it, it doesn't stick out to me. Like wow, there's not a lot of top end on that tone. Like maybe you would get with nails or yeah or whatever, but. Uh, but that, that Segovia story is great. Even if it's like 70% true, Gretchen, I think it's I, worth it. You know? I swear. Okay, so I heard this from my teacher who I sw- is like the greatest dude and not one. I mean, I, there are a lot of people I love who are writers, uh, not present company accepted, where I just I <laughs> calibrate their stories based on them wanting to give a, tell a good story. But that's not my teacher. So I, I really do believe it's true. Um, and if it had but, such a profound effect on him personally. Yeah. You know, yeah. like. Yet Segovia did it. use nails. Not yes, he did. And, and apparently he spoke out against it, which is why my teacher said he had this kind of like, you know, brain twist around this whole idea of that's how he responded to Maestro with the secret of your tone. Um, but no, I mean, but I, to I, your question, oh, sorry. Don't, oh, no, just, that's just, I mean, that's that goes back to what you said about a minute ago. That's such a personal thing and so much about personal physiology and neurology. Right. And, right. Uh, I say I've always been on the fence because I'm not, I studied classical in college and I, I went with a little bit of the nail route in college enough just to kind of get through my juries and whatever. But I'm more of like a hybrid pick and fingers player and I play a lot of country guitar and I've always tempted to like go the full on acrylic mm-hmm. thing, but I've just I've just held off. I just can't get over that fence to do it, you know? I was I was big classical guitar geek when I was young, and, and I play electric 95% with my fingers. And mm. what I've wound up doing is keeping nails, but keeping them really short and being mindful of the curvature of my picking hand. Um, and I find it's possible to regulate the amount of nail content from note to note. And it's possible yeah. to go from everything from a full on traditional rest stroke to never, never contacting the string after the initial attack. Right. And sort of that in between thing has worked out for me anyway. And I think that's probably ideal. I should really make it clear that I'm not saying that I think it's better to have no nails. Well, you're doing something really cool with exactly what you're doing. So. Yeah. Well, the point <laughs> is that's what I know. To fix anything. <laughs> that's what I know. That's what what I do. Now, now, having said that, of course, like you know, the vast majority of great classical guitar players have nails, and it sounds absolutely beautiful. And um, and I would imagine that maybe the best thing is to have the options of using them or not using them. So and that's kind I'm of probably what totally Segovia lazy. was. That's <laughs> kind of what Segovia yeah. was touching on in that story, where mm-hmm. he has the the control to use his nails when need be and his mm-hmm. fingers when he wants to. You know? Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. Well, I mean, depending on the angle of the nail, it can be the most infinitesimal adjustment and angle mm-hmm. between strong nail and no nail at all. Right. Now, now, also one other thing. Now, any classical guitar player knows this, but for people who maybe don't have a background in classical guitar, you guys both do. I feel like that the thing that makes the biggest difference in terms of tone production, regardless of whether or not you have nails, is where the movement comes from. Uh, often you can tell if, you can tell right away from the right hand if somebody has a classical background because even though people can get fantastic tone kind of moving from, from this like second knuckle. So, okay, if you consider your first knuckle, the one that's part of your palm, and then the second knuckle right, and third – People tend to initially kind of claw the strings like this, especially if they are more uh, like electric players. And a lot of times you can see great electric players hopping over to acoustic and maybe their left hand is going nuts and shredding like nobody's business, but their their tone is maybe a little thin, a little kind of snappy. Um, is classical guitar, you move from this first knuckle. And so you have just sort of more weight behind the note. And furthermore, you're not pulling the string up 
if anything, you're kind of pushing the string towards the body of the guitar, right? So you're getting this big, full tone that isn't a pluck in the same yeah, and we, way. And Jason and I can watch Gretchen while she's talking and, and watch what, what she just explained. But to kind of do a video translation, if, you, if she's holding her hand directly up right, right. and when making the plucking motion, you know, is it is it coming from that first joint where the finger meets the hand, or is it coming more from the second or even third joint, with the first knuckle remaining more right. or less parallel to the hand? And you're saying that the classical, you know, technique is a little bit is a is yeah. likelier to be a motion of the entire finger. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more like if you were to take your your hand right and curve your fingers and then move just your fingertips towards like sort of the bottom of the palm of your hand, right? Then, then you would get the feeling for what that motion is like. So like if you were to touch the palm of your hand um, and, and you could see this now with YouTube, you can get close-ups on like, you know, Christopher Parkening's hands or whatever and, uh, and see what this looks like. But normally you'll see with classical players, it's this kind of um, kind of rolling undulating motion as opposed to this plucking away from the string motion. And, and I think that the, tone is better. I mean, at least when I've sat down with people and full disclosure, I'm not a gr like a great classical player or a classical teacher, but even just showing them that their tone improves in, you know, a half an hour. Well, you, I mean, you hear a lot of virtuos virtuosic guitar records where, you know, a player who's primary, primarily an electric player might pick up a classical guitar and, you know, play some folk mm -hmm. flamenco or do something and, mm -hmm. okay. Um, when you switch to that voice, it's <laughs> complete authenticity. You know, oh. <laughs> you're, you're, you're playing, you're playing like someone who really knows what she's doing on the nylon strings and you don't oh. get a lot of the clackety clack qualities that often occur when a primarily electric player, um, switches over to nylon. Just well, thank you. I've, I've always felt like I've been a little bit of a a disappointment to my teacher because I was on the fence of like, do I go back and do grad school like as a, for in composition, focusing on classical guitar, or do I go try to start playing gigs? And I was, I was really for a while thinking I was going to go and study classical guitar more seriously. But then I thought I can always, I can always go back to school. You know, academia is maybe too much of a comfort zone for me. And I want to, I want to get my, my hands dirty a little bit. So, um, so I always feel like that I kind of bailed on my classical guitar training. <laughs> um, and well, you you mentioned composition again. I haven't seen the whole score for Inf Inferno, but mm -hmm. in the in the booklet for the for the CD, uh, we do see part of a page of the score. And mm -hmm. uh, this is for real composition, folks. <laughs> this is uh, you know, you, I mean, you've written out all the notes for all the instruments, and mm -hmm. you have you have this kind of cool. Um, uh, your handwriting reminds me of Stravinsky a little bit, kind of very, Sweet. very minimal and scientific, you know, like no, you know, just <laughs> really clean note heads and just, you know, it looks like a, like a, it's, it looks mathy in a, in a, in a very impressive way. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got it right here. There you go. There's my, <laughs> sorry, you can't see that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, honestly, most of it, was done like in Sibelius. What I'll often do is I'll sketch out ideas. Like here, I'm just kind of, I'm working on an idea for a new piece. And so a lot of times I'll kind of write out like my, um, uh, my materials, you know, like visual artists, maybe mixing their paints or whatever. So just kind of like I was trying some different modal stuff. And so writing out, you know, think re regular diatonic harmony. Okay. I'm pretty solid with that. I don't need to write it all out, but if I'm trying to do something that's more modal or, you know, altered stuff, you know, whole tone type harmony. I got to sit down and kind of work it out first. Um, okay, so, so, so I'll do that. I, I was mm. complimenting your penmanship and it was the um, handwriting font in Sibelius. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was, that was, um, no, that was my penmanship. What oh, you okay. saw. Oh. It was, but, but usually right after this, uh -huh. then I start putting stuff into Sibelius okay. just so that I don't have to copy it out later. So how do we get Sibelius to make a Gretchen Mann handwriting font? Oh, that would be great. Yeah. It's very, 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 it's a, it's a real, she's got a really nice script. Uh. Yeah. So, so to wrap up this episode, Gretchen, I want to ask you one thing. Uh, 
So you, you're, you've kind of really developed your fingerstyle technique and your approach to tone in college. What are things you do today as just maintenance? You know, if if you're playing a bunch of gigs like with Zepparella mm-hmm. and you're doing a lot of straight pick style stuff, do you feel like every once in a while you need to kind of recenter yourself when it comes to fingerstyle technique and do some maintenance on it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, like anything, um, use it or lose it. And the, the good thing is I feel like that because the initial training I had was very good because I wasn't allowed to develop bad habits, it's more like dusting off something that's, that's as solid as I was able to get with having a, a really good teacher. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if it's been a while since I played classical guitar, it, I definitely want at least a couple of weeks to kind of get my tone back and get my, um, you know, things feeling smooth again. So I, classical guitar finger style stuff is kind of like, it's home for me. It always reminds me of like when I first fell in love with the guitar. So. Well, are there some pieces that you always kind of revisit to, mm-hmm. to specific? Yeah. Like what? The second piece I ever played on guitar, I even do it live with my band. Um, and it's uh, uh, Leo Brower, Etude Symphony number six. It's a, uh, it's, it's a great one for just developing the right hand and, um, the independence of the fingers and like really balancing tone well between each finger. But the harmonies are so intriguing that uh, like initially I liked it just because it was kind of consistent and I could memorize it and I could play it. And it sounded like a piece, even though it was a steady. Now it's just like harmonically, it just blows me away. So I find that I don't get tired of playing it. Well, thanks so much Gretchen for joining us today. She's going to be back all the rest of this week to talk more uh, about nerdy guitar stuff. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gretchen. Thanks, Gretchen. Thanks. Super interesting. Oh, yeah. thank you guys. Delightful. All right. All right. We'll be back later this week with more Gretchen Men.